Oh, this is Greg Allison with Green Gregs and Galactic Gregs bringing you a joint video about asteroids. It is the 14th of October, 21. Time on deck is 23, 2900 hours Central Daylight Time. Now, because of processing time with YouTube, this will be posted sometime tomorrow. But I'm going to bring you a message about asteroids. New discoveries about asteroids in the uh, Taurid meteor belts and what that may mean for us. Uh, you know, the general notion of the threat of potentially hazardous asteroids, but I'm also bringing you some hope because there are people out there that are putting out stories claiming that we're gonna be getting impacts from those asteroids and some others. And quite frankly, they're not based on diddle. <laughs> to be very scientifically precise about it. So we're gonna get into that uh, at the moment. We, uh, of all the identified asteroids and all the identified asteroids have an astronomical name as assigned by the uh, International Astronomical uh, Union, the IAU. Uh, the, these asteroids are uh, tracked, known, and at this point, there is no known asteroid that threatens Earth in the next 100 years. So uh, we're going to talk about that. And guys, I used to know. Uh, Brian Marsden. Brian Marsden was the director of the Minor Planet Center, which was a subsidiary of the IAU. Uh, the IAU is based in France. The Minor Planet Center is part of the uh, uh, Smithsonian Institute, but they're actually based out of Cambridge, Massachusetts. So let's get into that, and uh, and we'll talk about these objects. We'll talk about uh, the threat of asteroids. There is a threat. But it's nothing that you need to, to, to be scared to death about or worry about immediately and imminently. And for those of you that follow uh, you know, this book here, uh, you know, in Revelations, uh, there, there is a lot of discussions about things that look like asteroid hits. And so maybe things are coming this way, but there's nothing identified as yet, contrary to some of the announcements that certain other channels make. And I'm gonna show you how some of those other channels made predictions last year at least one of them, that was absolutely wrong and how I called it in advance, called the bluff on it, and I was right. So uh, not to blow my horn, it's just that, you know, people accuse me of fear porn on my Green Greg's channel. It's because I tell you things that you should be prepping for. But however, I do tell you, uh, I try to give you a balanced notion about things, but I will also tell you things that you shouldn't be scared of. And I've done this before, and I'm going to do that here tonight, at least, well, immediately. <laughs> We should be worried about asteroids, but there are things we can do about them too. So it, it, there's nothing to be scared of yet. It doesn't mean there's something out there that we haven't found. There's always something that sneaks up on us, especially the smaller asteroids that we haven't discovered yet, but we're out working hard to find these objects. So <clears throat> hang on your hat and let's go for a ride to talk about these things. <laughs> and bear in mind that at least on my Green Greg's channel, I tell everybody it's a proposition. My channel help you survive, thrive, and stay out of the hive. And so we're going to be surviving and thriving here and not, and not, and not being in the hive. And so no Borgen <laughs> from my Galactic Greg's uh, friends here. So uh, subscribe to my channels, Green Greg's and Galactic Greg's. Bang the update notification bell and click all. If you're not subscribed to one channel, subscribe to the other. And uh, guys, I, I do also have a special deal because we do live in perilous times. There are a lot of potentials that could wreck our civilization. Our civilization is quite fragile. As many of you know, our atmosphere is mighty thin, but our civilization and our supply chains are even thinner as we're discovered right now with uh, supply chains unraveling around the world. And we're discovering supplies coming up short. But as I also tell you that the power grid is at great risk. I have chaired two power grid defense conferences. I also chaired an international space development conference prior to that and a couple of regional space conferences. And as many of you know, I have quite a background in rocketry. This is why I have got this uh, uh, Space Pioneer Award from the National Space Society and have a rocket motor sitting next to me right here. This is a fuel brain from a hybrid rocket motor from my Catch Prize rocket. Some of you might know what that is if you know anything about the Space Frontier Foundation and the Catch Prize. And we're the only guys who've made a flight attempt under those rules. And, uh, <laughs> and prior to that, we made the Guinness Book of World Records for a, a flight we've done. So 
Yeah, I know a little bit about space. I work space day and night, actually, for my day job. And I've done a lot of advocacy in space. I've uh, been one of the nation's premier space advocates for, for quite a while until about the last 10 years. So uh, I was, but anyway, enough for, for all that. Uh, <clears throat> but with all the challenges in front of us, civil here domestically, internationally, tensions with uh, China and Russia, it wouldn't be a good time. And with supply chains going down, with prices going, this is one of the best times to prep and get ready for the future. So uh, if you go to prepwithgreg.com, there's a special right now where you can get $100 off a three month supply of food that lasts 25 years, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, 2,000 calories a day. This is the deal that'll make you a winner. Uh, so I, I would check that out, guys. And it's uh, with uh, My Patriot Supply, which is simply the best in the, in the business because they have the widest selection of freeze dried and other long term storage food products where you can get gluten free, meat eaters, veg vegan, or you can get, you know, you can get number 10 cans. All kind of stuff, plus other prepping supplies. Uh, so if you, all you have to do is click their logo above, uh, on the top of that page. Go prepwithgreg.com. All right, enough said about that. We're going to talk about these asteroids. I'm going to share with you a bunch of articles. And we're just going to talk through them so you can see some of the aspects of what we're talking about here. Bing, bing. Okay, let me blow this up. <clears throat> this is a, a channel which a lot of you admire on the prepping side of the universe called uh, Israeli News Live. And uh, the, the, it's Stephen Ben-Noon and his wife uh, put on this channel. It's got a large following. He's got uh, 377,000 subscribers. And see, my views are a flat line compared to his. And I get some puny on, on green grigs, black grigs are smaller, but not proportionally smaller. Uh, 44,800 uh, views for me and <clears throat> over a million views for him. So he is a bigger channel. And he puts out a lot of prophetic type things. And, but, but sometimes he takes some liberties. And one of the videos that I'm coming on here to take exception with is this asteroid update video. And I am taking exception to that. He's, uh, <laughs> yes, he's quoting other channels here. Uh, but he, now, in all fairness, this channel he's quoting here, Mr. Uh, MBB333, actually did a fairly good summary of the torrid uh, asteroid belt. Uh, but uh, Stephen Benoon wanted to embellish upon that a little bit more than is scientifically uh, justifiable. <laughs> he makes claims of contacts with the secret space program and, and, and vast intel from there from. And I'll tell you what, here's why I, I, I feel comfortable in picking on that. Look at this. You see this video right here? This is a video I did in August the 13th of 2020. Uh, and I did this to, to uh, rebuke an earlier video or a series of videos that Stephen was doing last summer in which he was claiming, he made the following claims. He said, by September of 2020, no one on earth would be able to deny the asteroid belt, the interstellar asteroid belt he was talking about was going to bring all these asteroids in, impacting on Earth. We were going to be getting impacted in the fall and winter of that year. And that uh, no one would be able to deny the planet Nibiru. We were all going to see Nibiru very plainly. And, you know, people just conveniently forget these things. And so I got out in advance of that. And with this video says Nibiru comes not this way. Now, you'll have to watch this. this is on my green grace channel. You'll have to, well, now, those of you on Galactic Grace are probably laughing. Of course not. You know, I know that. Because look, <laughs> my space friends, you know, they think this is hilarious because, uh, and I explained it on this channel, on this video, why that's not a concern. Why it absolutely wasn't the case. And, and uh, why, uh, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of amateur astronomers are out there that would have discovered what he was talking about, if it had been the case. Uh, and, and no, these are not NASA. You know, so many people think, oh, it's all NASA. Everything's NASA. No, it's not. There's, there's literally, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of amateur astronomers worldwide. I got uh, on my Facebook channel, 5,000 friends. And I, I, I swear, probably at least 2,000 of them are astronomers. I have a lot of good astronomer friends that are professional astronomers. And like I said, I knew Brian Marsden, who was uh, the, the head of the uh, 
Minor Planet Center, which is a subsidiary of the IU, and he chaired, he he was the head of that organization from 1978 to 2006. Now this is in a period that I was especially active as a space activist. So I knew him. I also met the doctor. Uh, <coughs> Uh, Levy, who uh, uh, is, uh, no, excuse me, <laughs> I'm getting my mind, Dr. Hale, who was uh, one of the discoverers of Hellbop Comet. So, um, uh, and I've, I've had a good conversation with him a few times. So, you know, th these are people that, that, that I've known, I've hung around. Uh, you, you see astronomers come up to my farmer's market booth all the time, at least one in particular. So we'll go more into that. But guys, uh, just listen to what I had to say here. But Nibiru comes not this way. All right, guys, I said this August of last year, over a year ago, okay? That is what Greg Allison's got to say. And it's not going to be here in September. There are channels that are out there who say, well, we got the inside sources, and you're going to know this by September. I'm going to put my neck on the line and say, nope, that ain't happening. You may have other things going on. Go back and see my top five risks to the end of 2020. There's plenty of things to be concerned about, but this is one that you shouldn't be losing your sleep over. I mean, an asteroid don't hit us. No, don't mean that at all. It means that we don't have a planet or an identified debris field coming in at us uh, in that near time. So there we go. <laughs> I put my neck on the line and my neck is still intact. <laughs> so uh, how is it that Stephen Benoon still can claim credit, credibility to come on here and make videos like this. And all his uh, contacts, originally, back when he was doing it last summer, he was claiming he had contacts in the Pentagon, and contacts in the uh, Intel community. Guys, he don't bring them on his channel. I brought you on my channel on Green Greg's, the former head of Ronald Reagan's Star Wars program, the Strategic uh, Defense Initiative Organization, Ambassador Hank Cooper. Yes, Ambassador Hank Cooper. I have brought you guys General uh, Ken Crosney. I bring you generals, ambassadors, uh, national experts, and, and people from the intel community, uh, Dr. Peter Vincent Pry. Uh, I have these contacts. I bring them on this channel. I don't hide them. This isn't some mystery behind the curtain kind of thing. So, uh, and I've got the contacts. This is the people that I deal with on a day to day basis. And I'm here to tell you that we don't know of anything out there that's coming right at us right now. And if there were anything that big, as he was insinuating then, uh, go to that video and watch it. I, I explain in great detail why and how it would be discovered. And the amateurs all over the world have known about it long before, months before he even started talking about this stuff. Now there is indeed uh, asteroids hidden in the torrid asteroid, uh, excuse me, uh, meteor shower belts. And they can really pose a huge risk to Earth. And apparently some of the impacts on Earth and the moon have come from that source. So it's nothing to discount. But uh, the, the way he plays it up is the sky's falling. It's falling immediately. And all this stuff's going to be hitting us, you know, again, this, this winter kind of thing. So I would say there's things to be worried about, but I wouldn't lose sleep over that. You know? <laughs> there are other bigger things that are chomping on us. And I talk about them. The only thing I'm more, more worried about is losing our power grid or our tensions with China, Russia, and North Korea. And our and I got a video, I got some videos coming up next week and the week after on that, because I'll be interviewing Dr. Peter Vincent Pry and Dr. and David Pine also. So these are things that uh, you can watch uh, national experts on these topics, at least on my Green Greg's channel. So let's uh, let's get past this. Now, hey, I I, I don't want to really beat on this guy here, uh, uh, Stephen Benoon. I think maybe he's really a good guy. Uh, I just think he's, he gets a little excited. <laughs> That's all. He gets a little excited. I don't know what his sources are, but uh, guys, I, I got no faith in his sources because he really blew it last summer. And listen, he talks about these asteroids. He doesn't name a one of them. Supposedly they're going to hit us. He doesn't have an astronomical name that can sign to any one of them. And he also says, but you know, we've got technology in the secret space program that can avert these impacts and, and redirect them and prevent them. So maybe that will happen. So that's his get out of jail free card. When this don't happen, he'll claim that they had success diverting these uh, asteroids. Okay. That's like the people who claim 
that they get abducted at night. They spend 20 years on Mars and then they get uh, by the secret space program and they get uh, uh, regress aged back to the minute that from which they were abducted and put back in their bed. No, there's people that claim that really. <laughs> you might, maybe you believe them. <laughs> yeah, you know, that's a little hard for me to swallow, okay? <laughs> But, hey, I worked for the Strategic Defense Initiative Organization back in 1988. That's how I got that calendar, guys. <laughs> Hank Cooper's program. So I'm not here to, to I'm not here to snow job you guys. I mean, you can check this stuff out. Check with the amateur astronomers. There's, they're all over the world. They're all over the world. It's not all NASA. There's many, many organizations, many, people from many different faiths. There's Christian, there's Buddhist, there's Islamic, Hindu. Uh, you know, atheist, uh, every religion or no religion, there's astronomers in all these communities and they're not all on one sheet, but you know, they all agree that they're interested in what's out there and they're looking to find out. And <clears throat> I talk about the physics of that in this previous video. I'm not gonna go into that anymore. Let's just go forward here and talk about what we do know. Now, excuse me, this is that British Daily Mail site and they load up with ads. Unfortunately, yeah, sometimes they get good material, but the ads they, they're, they're killers. They kill the memory too in my realm. So I'm going to kill this side as soon as I show it here. Dozens of near Earth asteroids hidden in debris that produces a tarred meter shower formed from a breakup of a giant. They said 62 mile wide comet. Actually, that's the same size as the, the Bernard and Delhi Bernstein. And <laughs> we'll go over that in a minute. Comet. Uh, well, actually, that comet's bigger probably it, it, the minimum size is this size but they believe that they're uh, uh, and this is not really new news this has been uh, studied and proposed from back in the 90s uh, and so but they've been making some more recent finds about this and so they, they've been uh extolling on this quite a bit lately and that's part of what excited Stephen Benin I believe and you know, maybe some of his sources uh, like I said I'm not too keen on his sources uh, you know, guys, I, I, I'm plugged into this aerospace, astronomy, defense, intelligence community, I, I, military. I know these people. So, you know, I'm, and I bring them on my channel, guys, some of them. So unlike him, he's, he, when does he ever bring these people on for an interview? I don't know. Uh, so the, anyway, here we go, guys. Uh, I'm going to also show you there's plenty of scientific papers on this. So, yeah, this is kind of like the National Enquirer. So. <laughs> Pardon me for showing this, but uh, yeah, they're technically correct in this article, and they talk about uh, uh, that this is astronomers in the university uh, here in Medellin, Colombia, that made some discoveries. I mean, hey guys, they got huge uh, uh, observatories in the Andes Mountains, so you know, uh, so they they make a lot of good discoveries down there in the Andes. Uh, some of the best observatories in the world. And talking about. Uh, so oh, this is almost starting back in the 1980s. I said 90s. Popular astronomers William Napier and Victor Klebe, uh, however he says his name, to suggest that then they were suggesting a, a shared parent with Kami Enki. Because a lot of people thought Kami Enki. And no, this is not spelled like uh, the Anunnaki Enki, okay? Huh, this is E-N-C-K-E, not E-N-K-I. Uh, but it's pronounced the same. So I know some of you people are going to say this is Enki and associate Enki with the devil and all that good happy stuff. <laughs> Anunnaki and all that good happy stuff. And for those of you that don't know what Anunnaki is, that's the Sumerian gods, you know, or at least that's what they thought. All right, some of these asteroids are more than a mile wide. In this debris field, okay, that today we're seeing there's asteroids in there, some of them more than a mile wide. That would be catastrophic if they hit Earth. No kidding, that is true. And some that was thought that the 1908 Tunguska event uh, was from one of these objects. It was thought that the uh, object. Uh, that hit Russia, the Chelyabinsk explosion, was one of these objects. And furthermore, and especially one of the biggest catastrophic events in the last 20,000 years since this comet is believed to have broke up 20,000 years ago, would have been the uh, strike on the Laurentide ice sheet that uh, ended the megafauna, large animals in North America and Europe. And put an end to the Clovis culture that lived in North America, I, an entire people that lived from the Eastern seaboard all the way out to uh, Clovis, I guess, New Mexico, um, which had made spear points that were very similar to points found in France, not like the points that come over from uh, Asia. 
So it might have been a, so the, the Paleo Indians might have actually been white, but they got entirely wiped out by this event. Wiped out, I mean, extincted, just like uh, the, the giant ground sloth and the short nosed uh, bear, cave bear, the dyer's wolf, and many other megafauna creatures in North America, Not including the North American horses and camels. And, uh, you know, fortunately, horses made it out of the Americas into Asia, but they originated in America. Had they stayed here and not got it to Asia, they would have been extincted entirely, and we wouldn't have Tennessee walking horses. <laughs> Okay, so um, so they're talking about uh, the, these studies here and the threats they pose. So yeah, indeed, these objects can pose a grave threat. Uh, we haven't identified one that's about to hit us. Okay, guys, I'm gonna go in a lot more. So it passes through part of the stream every year, appearing as shooting stars in the sky ever October. Yeah, we're there. <laughs> In the Southern Hemisphere in November and the Northern Hemisphere. Tommy Inky was first spotted in 1786. So, hang on, guys, I'm about to sneeze. <laughs> oh, that's true. But Common Inky is not big enough to source all these things. That's where they fig figure and uh, also uh, one of the other belt sets. Now, I'll show you a Wikipedia article that's not up to date, even. It's show talking about two of the torrid belts. There's actually three. A new one's been discovered if they haven't taken credit for you in there. Um, I'm about to kill this article. It's got too much junk in it. It's hard to follow through here. Um, yeah, we're going to kill this article. Uh, why is the TARD complex? Yeah, we'll, we'll go into that more than the article. I'm going to kill this. Put up some memory. It's going to take it a minute for to kill it, though. <laughs> That's the downside. Uh, gain some memory back. Good. Just checking that out. Now we're going to go into more scientific papers. I thought there might be some pretty pictures in that article. <laughs> Sometimes the uh, glitzier stuff likes to show uh, a lot of pictures, but this time it really wasn't up to par <laughs> in for Daily Mail. Uh, like I said, kind of a, it's actually a, a legitimate British newspaper, but I kind of think of it because it filled up so many goofy ads, I think of it being kind of like uh, uh, National Enquirer. Yeah, you get an ad or two from me, but not, you know, it's not like you know, everywhere. Study of prior research suggests there is a swarm of large asteroids hidden in the torrid complex. Okay, guys, this is fizz.org, okay? Fizz.org. This is a physics website. And here they're showing uh, the comet Inky's family. And all these objects they believe to be. Let's just you know, explain this out a little bit. You know, that don't make it any bigger. I hate it when it just makes it clearer. <laughs> you still can't read that little type. Oh, well, so much for that. I could download it and probably blow it up, right? And so there's different groups, different groups here in, in this uh, Inky, uh, they said common Inky's family. Well, they're not all with Inky, actually. I'll show you that when we go to the Torrid Meteor. Uh, uh, page in Wikipedia. And here they're talking about the same uh, scientist uh, from the University of uh, Anna, I can't pronounce that. <laughs> uh, University of Salento has found evidence of a large swarm of asteroids hidden in the Tartar complex. So once they had postulated, now they're, they're finding them. Every year at the end of October, the event known as the Tartar meteor shower occurs. It's about to start. So heads up, it's coming, guys. Uh, and it might be interesting. We might get a, ch uh, a, a chill binks or uh, or a 1908 event, but you know, it's you know, if, if you're rolling the dice, it's, you know, it's not all that likely, but it can happen. It can happen in terms of a civilization in an event. Mm, it's possible, but not likely from this particular source. Not, at least not now. Every year in October, let's see, uh, it talks about the meteor showers. And it, it, hey, it's worth watching some beautiful meteor showers. I like the uh, Minnesota a little better myself in November. I have seen some of the best meteor, uh, meteors I've ever seen in the Minnesota shower. Huge bolides, one after another after another for, for hours. Uh, one of my particular ones out jogging at night back in the days when I used to jog for mess my feet up. So uh, just talking about uh, you know, the, go relatively close to the sun. Uh, 
and I'm talking about these claims that found a large swarm of asteroids hiding in that complex. <clears throat> Two of the asteroids have not been seen before. Right. So the what that means is a bunch of them had been seen, named and numbered. They, they discovered two that had not. And now they are named and numbered too, okay? <laughs> Measurements of the uh, two space rocks show them to be 200 and 300 meters across. It means the ones that were a mile got named and numbered. I don't mean there's not others in the debris field, but they found two that they named and numbered. Okay, guys, because all this stuff goes to the uh, IAU catalog and then minor planet center actually for these smaller objects like this. So the data shows evidence that the large asteroids and Inky and Inky's comet and thus debris originated from a shared comet that, that both likely came into being approximately, I mean, all this stuff came into being from this comet about 20,000 years ago. They believe that comet broke up then. Research is also right that the large asteroids could pose a threat to Earth, noting that the Tunguska event, that's the 1908 Siberian explosion, also called Tunguska event, uh, has been linked to the Tard complex, as has the disappearance of some early cultures during the Younger Dryas cultures. And I'm talking about the Clovis people in North America, and perhaps some European cultures too, particularly in Western Europe. Probably anybody that lived in Western Europe at that time, the original Cro-Magnon man was probably extinct, at least the ones in that area, whatever cultures they had. And if there had been some slip through surviving Neanderthal, which we believe got wiped out 20,000 years prior, and that probably would have been the finishing touch on them. You know, sometimes some creatures don't, you know, they disappear from the fossil record because their numbers go down, but I don't mean they're entirely extinct. So this is another, this is a scientific article from the Oxford Academic talking about the Paleolithic extinctions, the ones we just mentioned, and the Tard complex. So this is an entire paper that goes into great detail, talking about that, talking about uh, the potential impact on the Laurentide ice sheet. And I'm gonna show you some stuff about the Carolina Bays that seems to uh, support this too. Again, here is, uh, this is maybe a little better rendition of where these objects are around the orbit. Uh, you know, it's not a perfectly circular orbit. So this is kind of an idealized rendition of it, but it's probably just angles, right? So, right, high eccentricity, <laughs> near earth asteroids selected and described in the text. Okay, here they are guys. Like I said, they name them, they number them, they categorize them, they track them. This is what I'm talking about, okay? I'm not kidding about that. They, they go out of their, their people, you know, discovery of an asteroid is a big thing. Everybody's trying to discover asteroids. There's a whole lot of astronomers out there trying to find and discover asteroids. I have friends that do. In fact, there's an asteroid that's got the name HAL 5 in it. HAL 5, Tunstall, Alabama, L5 Society, is a space organization I formed back in 1983. And it's got its name on one of those asteroids by uh, an astronomer who come and briefed us about his work in that area of discovering asteroids. Now, that's a main belt asteroid. The new Earth asteroid is a little harder to find. We're talking about nano diamonds discovered. There's a lot of evidence here that points to a um, impact uh, on Earth. It, uh, it, it caused the younger Dryas. And the ice age was like kind of ending, it was warming up, and suddenly it got really bitterly cold and dry after that. And dusty and life just uh, turned to, mm, you know, where you had life on North America, like you know, on the East Coast, uh, for, for there's like several feet of sand and silt out there with nothing in it. Uh, nothing. Like there's no ice in North, that part of North America uh, for, for some time. All right. This is another article uh, talking about the same stuff right here. You'll find a bunch of these. There's a bunch of these articles out here. Inky meteor showers. They're citing a lot of the other people that have done work in this area. This is copy written. So we're not actually opening this article because we got to go into all that to do that. And let's come over here. Now I told you I was going to tell you about the Carolina Bays. The Carolina Bays are some of the evidence that's cited for this. And if you don't know, in the Carolinas and other parts of this country, 
there's all these elliptical bays. And what you find is they're all lined up pretty much in the same direction. And it's, uh, 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 an ellipse has two foci and an axis between the foci. Uh, you know, a circle has one foci in the center. An ellipse, they start separating the two separate foci. Now, if you're in a room that has a true elliptical ceiling, if you sit at one foci and somebody sits across, I, I did this in a hotel one time. I, I, I told this guy, hey, look, I said, go over there and sit in that couch. It was way across the room, like, you know, 20, 30 feet, maybe 40 feet. And I sat on my side and we just talked to each other, had a normal conversation. People would walk by and we'd think, we'd think we're each talking to ourselves, but we could hear what each other was saying. That's one of the, and some people taking advantage of that in the capital to listen in on conversations back in the days before we had all this mess. <laughs> but the, the folk are great for focusing things like sound. But they also have this axes, and these axes is pointing in the same direction. And what you can find from that is they're, they're traceable to impact points. This is what we found, guys. Uh, all these guys, I don't know if I can open this photo up. No, that won't click and open. There's all these bays here, and all these bays out here, uh, uh, not bays, uh, impact points, you know, the Carolina bays, but they're just splotches, basically where something came out from the impact and just put a shower of debris that, that rained down large debris over a long distance. And there may have been chunks of the Laurentine ice sheets that may have all just melted after impact. I don't know, maybe have been chunks of the impact ore, uh, which would have been cometary in origin. So this was probably a chunk, a piece of that other comet. And also mind you, they discovered a big impact in Northern uh, Greenland that dates back to the same time period and a couple of other impacts on Earth. You know, comets break into many pieces and, and even the, the, the sub pieces tend to break apart because they're basically flying rubble piles. Uh, dirty snowballs is one analogy to them. Sometimes they got more to them than snow. So this is a paper that goes all into this and that gives a lot of evidence. And, uh, for this supposition that we had a large impactor on the Laurentide ice sheet that caught, and the dates right, the nano diamonds, shock core, you find all this stuff you would expect to find from a space impact at that point in time, except it didn't hit the ground, not directly. It hit the ice sheet, which was two miles thick at that point. And it was a comet that hit it. Most of it probably, a lot of it may have exploded in the atmosphere over that, but enough of it hit the ice sheet that it threw out ejecta all over the United States, all over North America. And so North America was probably uh, baked and cooked and drowned and drenched all at the same time. So uh, life would have been rough in North America. Not much survived. I mean, you see all this radius here? I mean, it wiped out everything from the East Coast uh, down out toward New Mexico, California. I mean, there were, you know, the megafauna lived in California too. So the entire North America got obliterated, probably parts of Mexico, South America, who knows how far, but you know, South America maintained some animals uh, that were unique to them, but not really megafauna. So there's no megafauna in the Americas, and maybe this is why. The megafauna, you know, the woolly rhinoceroses that lived, <laughs> yeah, let's say that the way, that lived in uh, Europe got wiped out. So a lot of people think that uh, mastodons and all these things were wiped out by uh, the uh, indigenous people. Uh, they were probably mostly done in by this, although Wrangell Island, which is just north of Siberia, close to Alaska actually, uh, is believed to have had a small uh, compact species of woolly mammoths up until maybe 400 years ago. So the woolly mammoth only recently completely died out. Uh, some people are talking about resurrecting them from the Gen X. Oh, there's a lot of stuff here. There's a lot of papers on this. Let's move on. Uh, yikes. Uh, I don't know. Maybe there's stuff that hit the, the tabs here. All right, the Tards. This is Wikipedia talking about the Tards. They're talking about the Southern Tards and the Northern Tards. Uh, this is two different belts in the Tarred uh, uh, meteor fields. And it turns out there's a third one that's just been discovered they haven't put in wikipedia yet it's kind of interesting. wikipedia is usually up to date not to be confused with beta cards hmm 
daytime. Oh yeah, that's daytime meters. No, there's another one. So they're talking about the ones you can see in their beta tards. <laughs> the tards are an annual meter shower associated with the comet Inky. But now look here. The southern tards, that they accredit that to Inky, but the northern tards, they accredit to this other object, 2004 TG, an eccentric asteroid classified as an Earth object, potentially has an asteroid of the Apollo group, which means it crosses Earth's orbit. First uh, observed by Space Watch Survey on 8 October 2004. It may be a fragment of comet Inky. And it may be, or it may be a fragment of the parent. Either way, it's a, uh, apparently a fragment of the parent comet. And these things break up. So appearances, uh, they talk about these things, the bolides. So I'm not going to go all into that. But here's what you need to know. The southern parts, if you're in the southern hemisphere, they're occurring already from September the 10th to November the 20th. The northern tards start on October the 20th, which is real soon, and they go through December the 10th. So check them out. I mean, this is worth watching, guys. Um, and you get some really good fireballs sometimes, some really good bolides. Most of the time, this cometary debris is stuff about the size of a speck of sand, and that makes a pretty good meteor. Something bigger, it could get interesting, right? <laughs> So it's worth watching. Now here is something else that's hot. So imagine this, just imagine that if you had been an indigenous human being on earth 20,000 years ago when that comet broke up, imagine a comet 62 miles wide in diameter. You know, it's like a thousand times bigger than comet Hellbop, which hung in the sky when we were doing uh, the Halo SO-1 rocket that got me this, uh, Space Pioneer Award. So that comet was hanging in the sky. It's the best comet I ever saw in my life. I saw a comet Hayataki too, but it just didn't have the brilliance. It was bigger than tail wise, but it didn't have the brilliance of tail bomb. Now, if this comet 20,000 years ago would have been, it would have blown your mind. Probably just filled the whole sky. I mean, there's talks. I used to read about comet, uh, uh, oh shoot, what's, what's the one that. Uh, went through that you know everybody used to know that went through in 2010 came back in the 80s uh, I mean, i'm getting brain locked right now that uh, the, the, the year uh, mark twain's birth and death was years of this coming i'm getting brain locked right now guys bear with me but uh in 1910 you know people were outside reading by the because earth passed through its tail and it's such a big comet the next time it came around it just fizzled out i really had big hopes for seeing that one and well, I can't, I'm getting brain locked, guys. <laughs> It'll come to me as soon as I end this video. Just as soon as I shut it off. Oh, <laughs> yeah. I can't believe I can't think of that right now. But anyway, so um, uh, Haley's Comet. Ah, I got it. Yeah, Haley's Comet was hanging in the sky when it the Norman invasion in 1066. People used to really fear comets. They were considered bad omens. And maybe it goes back to this comet from uh, 20,000 years ago. That would have been a huge comet. It would have had a huge tail. It would have been a crazy bright. It would have been told about for eons after it passed through the solar system. I mean, that would have created all kinds of stories. And the debris that came out of it would have created lots of stories. And some of that debris hit Earth. And then maybe smaller pieces hit Earth repeatedly after that, like the Tunguska explosion. So, yeah, people had a good reason to fear comets. I mean, you know, after something like that, but could you imagine seeing it? Could you imagine the spectacle, the sight to see? It would have been mind boggling. It would have been quite a sight to watch. Absolutely. It is, if you, especially if you didn't live in an area that's close to an impact. <laughs> but that would have had global consequences. It absolutely would have had it. Well, it did. It had global consequences. The Younger Dryas was a, a galactic, uh, was a planetary a climatic change that lasted for what, a thousand years? It was huge. Uh, so uh, it wasn't as big as the Chilbix, uh, no, as the uh, Chicxulub event, which wiped out the dinosaurs, not near, nearly as big as that. But it was, it was a major extinction, even though it's not counted as one of the five major extinctions. Uh, you know, so, you know, so, but it was quite an extinction event. So I'm kind of surprised that they don't rise up to that level or close to that category, but it don't. So there have been much worse extinctions. Uh, and we also had a very big comet that hit uh, about you know 30 some odd million years ago in, in the Chesapeake Bay area. Uh, so I don't know, North America's had history of getting pummeled. <laughs> yeah. Mexico, uh, Laurentide Ice Sheet, uh, the, the, the Chesapeake Bay, 
I don't know, guys, we might need to move out. <laughs> but there's nothing posing immediate uh, threats. To us. Now, here's this comet. They're saying here it's roughly 150 kilometers. Well, basically, it's something like uh, in diameter. Basically, it's something like 100 to 200 kilometers. Now, 100 would be 62 miles, like the, the one they're thinking about that broke up and caused Comet Inky and all the other uh, tarred meteor uh, complex, asteroids and meteors and meteorites and so forth. Uh, so here's some other objects. Here's the moon, Martian moon Phobos by comparison to this. Phobos is small, some other asteroids. This thing is huge. It is huge. And there's sensational headlines claiming this thing is coming toward Earth. Well, it's kind of sort of heading in this general direction, but it's never going to come inside the orbit of Saturn. So that's fair point. Um, uh, now, if it broke up, uh, the debris of it would follow the centroid of its center of mass. I don't mean that some pieces of that might not come closer to us, but because uh, it's just so big and got so much material. But it still most of it would follow the centroid of, of the center of mass. And since it's not coming that close to the sun or Jupiter, uh, which tends to uh, have a rough effect on comets and asteroids, I would think that it will leave us mostly intact, or at least uh, not having a lot of stuff coming into the innermost rocky planet regions of the solar system. And I could be wrong with that, but I'm, I have no expectation of that. I, I'm thinking all this stuff can come by. You may never even be able to see this thing with your naked eye, but it's so big, maybe it will off gas enough that we can see it. You know, there might be the bleak machine, right? <laughs> I hope you talked about it. Yeah, I do hope that we can see this. Now, if something like this came in the inner solar system, one, you would hope it wouldn't break up going around the sun. That's if it did. Uh, you know, and, and especially if it was on a shorter period orbit, we could have a lot of trouble. Now, apparently this time at 20,000 years ago, it was probably a, a, a Oort cloud or copper belt object that got perturbed and came in our inner solar system. It might've got too close to Jupiter and had its orbit adjusted so that it became a shorter term uh, orbit, kind of like Comet Inky. If you had a huge object, a lot of debris coming in a shorter term like it, yeah, you would be, you would have something to worry about big time. Fortunately, this thing is gonna go bye-bye, I hope. But that doesn't mean that something like this couldn't come along one day because stuff coming out of the work cloud is so far out that the orbits are tens of thousands of years in the making. So it's just hard to know uh, when something like that last passed. We just don't have, and this is before we had history. So we don't know a lot of the stuff that's out there yet, what it might come. You know, this is the notion of our solar system. Uh, a lot of people tell us, oh, yeah, Comet Nibiru is on the other side of the sun. That's why we can't see it. Well, that goes all the way around the sun. Anything coming from way out, uh, we'll see it eventually. I mean, the only way something can always be on the other side of the sun is if it's actually in Earth's orbit on the other side of the sun. And I'm not going to go on with that today, but I did explain that in more detail in my previous video. That's why you're not going to get a big planet sneaking up off on us. I mean, guys, we discovered this thing, and it's like 100 kilometers in diameter. It's way out. It's outside the solar system now. And in 2031 or so, we'll be inside, just outside the orbit of Saturn. Once a comet gets inside the orbit of Jupiter, everybody sees it, guys. So this stuff just isn't sneaking up on us like uh, I heard a good friend uh, Stephen Manoon has led to think. But hey, he's not a he's not a scientist. He's not an engineer. So I, you know, I, I can't blame him for misunderstanding that because he don't have that kind of background. And maybe somebody's feeding him something, but he needs to he, he needs to watch who he's eating knowledge from. <laughs> All right, Oort cloud. This is interesting, though, guys, because this is apparently the origins of this uh, big comet. And maybe that other one or ultimately came in from the Oort cloud. To give you an idea, this scale here is not linear. Uh, this is one, that's 10, and that's 100. You see, every unit, this, it gets to be 10 times more. So it looks like the same on here. This way you show a lot of distance on a small page and still put stuff like this. I mean, if this was all linear, all this would be all the Earth and the planets would be a little bitty dot next to the sun uh, to give you some idea. And, and, and the dot would be so small you wouldn't be able to sit for the sun. So one is one astronomical unit. It's the distance between Earth and the sun. That's astronomical unit, about 93 million miles. And Venus is about a little more than two astronomical units from the sun, and Mercury is a little better than one, okay? 
give you some comparison. But as you go out, so this is a this is a logarithmic scale, and so this is a hundred astronomical units right at the edge. What's considered the edge of our solar system? So the Oort cloud does orbit the sun. Uh, Voyager one is right about here, about a hundred astronomical units out. Heliopause, that's the kind of the edge of where our solar wind pushes out the galactic winds and other things. Terminator shock is back here. Uh, and then we got the Oort cloud right here. These are comets that more or less orbit the sun, but they go half about halfway out to the nearest star. And again, remember, this, this looks like it's right up on the other star, but it's really not. This again is a uh, chart which is which kind of makes these bigger distances look smaller. You get it all on one page. This is a logarithmic chart. The stars are way out there. Okay. The work cloud, though, does go about halfway to the other stars in your star. It's Alpha Centauri. All right, so that kind of explains that. And so I'll show you some other diagrams of the work cloud to give you another idea of what it looks like. Here we go. Uh, this is the inner planets. This is the Kuiper belt, which is right here. This, this whole diagram is right here inside of this. This is the believed to be the work cloud. There's lots of objects in this. There's a lot of things that we could mine, guys. <laughs> That's the way to look at it, including the Kuiper belt. Uh, this is the orbit of Pluto here, this blue orbit. The red orbit is orbit of binary Kuiper belt object, 1988 WW31. <laughs> so this is showing Kuiper belt objects, Pluto. That's why a lot of people say Pluto is just a Kuiper belt object because there's bigger ones out here in the Kuiper belt than Pluto. That's how Pluto got derated from being a planet to being a minor planet or a planetoid, you might say. The door cloud, unlike all this stuff, which is in the plane of the cliff, the door cloud is more circular around the sun. There's been some recent articles that suggest that formation occurred because the sun once had another uh, star as a partner, and that star apparently got ripped away and there's now somewhere else in the galaxy. They, they claim that's how you could wind up with a circular cloud, is if the Earth once had a partner, which it no longer has. So this is a remnant of the dynamics of having two stars, and that star would also have a cloud around it, uh, theoretically. So who knows where Earth's early partner went and, and the sun's early partner. So there you go. Right, I'm going to stop this share. I'm just going to chat a minute. Again, I don't mean to beat on Stephen Benoon. Uh, like I said, he's not an astrophysicist. He's not an engineer, a space guy, an astronomer. He's just a guy that, you know, he's read some prophecy, he knows some, some things there, and he's thinking he's found the confirmation of it. And indeed, confirmation may be found and things may hit us. You know, uh, I could pull up the, uh, I'll do it. You know, it's in the other video where I went to uh, uh, spaceweather.com. You can find a list of, of the, the stuff that's coming at us in the, in the near future and asteroids. You can go to the NEO site at JPL, Jet Propulsion Laboratory. It's based in Pasadena, California. They, they have a big site. We can go in and find out a lot about near Earth orbit, object, near Earth objects, excuse me, asteroids, NEOs, NEOs, whatever you want to call them, potentially hazardous asteroids. Uh, like I said, there's some we're worried about. We're worried about Binyu, we're worried about Apophis. And you know, we just sent a probe to venue and it's brought back materials, bringing back materials. Venue uh, is a big flying rubble pile, Apophis. Uh, it comes dangerously close to Earth, you know, and, and a couple times here in the next you know, few years. But uh, we, we're now beginning to think it's not going to hit us. So we're pretty confident in that. I mean, I don't I mean something else still won't hit us, guys. I mean, it's all probability. But the probability, just from the standpoint of probability alone, that something's going to hit us in the next few years is not great. Over the long term, it's a certainty. <laughs> Eventually, things are going to hit us because they keep doing it. These bigger asteroid uh, type events that tend to wipe out about everything, about every 30 million years, the big dials, the really huge dials, about every 250 million years, like the permanent extension. Which is bigger than the the dinosaur extinction, but dinosaur extinction events, you know, you might say they're 65 or 100 million years for those, um, but maybe more frequently. I, we think we've just really missed that one, that whatever it was that, that puts us on that cycle, we just missed. And it looks like that cycle is about 30 million years on the order of 30 million years. So we had the dinosaur 
we had the extinction, we had the impact in Chesapeake Bay, but we just missed that time frame, that 30 million year time frame, 25 to 30 million years is what it's believed to be, which is, I think, roughly equivalent to the Earth's bobbing, the sun bobbing up and down uh, around the galactic uh, plane itself of the Milky Way. Like the Milky Way is here, and the sun goes around it as it bobs up and down. It goes through maybe a compression wave, maybe there's more density and other objects there that disturb the work clouds. Uh, I don't know. Uh, approaching other stars might be more uh, frequent because they're just the denser, uh, uh, they might have a higher density inside that plane of the ecliptic. But whatever drives that event has not hit us this time. So we lucked out, and maybe that's why we are here. But the, um, aside from being created, of course, but <laughs> the, uh, Biggest dial, so about over 250 million years, happens to coincide with how long it takes for Earth and Sun, Sun and Earth to get all the way around the galaxy. And it's thought that there is a, what's called a Sagittarius arm of a red dwarf galaxy that's kind of poking, that is colliding with our galaxy and will be absorbed by, it's kind of poking through this way against the plane. So maybe we're coming close to that and it's creating a uh, higher flux density of other objects that might perturb things out at the Oort cloud, which goes out halfway to the other stars anyway. So it may be something like that that causes the bigger dial. So the permanent extinction is given over to the Siberian traps, which 250 million years ago, you had this huge volcanic thing in Siberia. Of course, that could have been precipitated by something hitting the Earth. You know, it's not that when something hits the Earth, one, you're going to poke a hole right there into the mantle, and you might get stuff up well in there. But the shock wave of that event, Will travel all the way around the earth onto the other side and really break up the crust on the other side and can cause major volcanism there. Interestingly enough, the Deccan traps, if you had the earth 65 million years ago and you looked at the uh, uh, Chicxulub crater impact point in the Yucatan Peninsula and you went all the way through the earth from there. What would have, where you have came out on the other side would have been India, about where India was, or the Deccan traps. Now, some people say the Deccan traps predated all that. Now, I really have to wonder about that because it's highly interesting that the effect that you would get would be a break up the crust on the other side that would have caused lots of volcanism. And that volcanism that happened to occur directly in the antipode of the Chicxulub impact. Strange, very, very, very strange. Unless it was a planned kill shot by somebody. Let's get rid of these dinosaurs. <laughs> yeah, if we put this coming in right on the other side of the decking traps, we'll get a one two punch and that'll wipe them all out. Hmm, who did that plan? <laughs> so, I don't know, guys, I'm just wild speculation there just for fun. We do that sometimes here, we like to have a little fun. Uh, that and again, that is just wild, crazy speculation, like a live action role playing session, a art session. <laughs> um, what what happened because of the Deccan traps? Maybe we got a date wrong. Maybe we misdated it. Maybe it originated from that impact. If not, it's highly curious that if the antipode on the other side of the Earth from the Deccan traps was the impact of that asteroid. Comet, whatever it was, that hit. a lot of people these days think it was an asteroid, but it might have been a piece of, it have been a uh, comet related, well, probably not related, because that other comet just broke up 20,000 years ago, believed to be. I don't know. We didn't know the work cloud. Even the, the Kuiper Belt has some mighty large objects. So things could disturb me occasionally, increase the flux density of those objects coming through the inner solar system. And that may be what causes some of the larger dial, some of the larger cycles. And it's, it's also interesting that the largest dial cycle coincides roughly the time scale of going around the galaxy. The other dial seems to have some correlation to our bobbing up and down through the galactic, to the galactic plane. Seems to. You know, that's these are speculative notions, hypotheses, not theories. Theories have required a lot of rigor and proof to be a real theory. <laughs> So there are hypotheses, okay? Something that we think is plausible, maybe. So and, you know, to, to do this, you know, if you can, you hold experiments. You gotta have ways of isolating variables and testing one thing 
with just one variable in isolation. It's hard to do that in the real world. So we look for evidence in the geological rec and astronomical records, and we look for things, compare things by. And so science gets a little murkier when you have to work outside of the laboratory to ascertain what the truth is. Okay, there's my big caveat for everything I just said. <laughs> the big ginormous caveat. The truth about science is it's murky. They say that science advances when the previous generation of scientists dies off, so the new ones can, can now come forth with the theories that they've been trying to put out there, they've been stepped down on for ages. You know, that's how we got quantum mechanics and all these different things. <laughs> Which basically says, God plays dice with the universe, but really and truly, I think he plays billiards. <laughs> the billiards are the asteroids, the planets. You know, what's the cue ball? What's the eight ball? <laughs> Did we get racked up? <laughs> Let's hope not. All right, guys. So there you are. There's a, there's a lot to ponder here, a lot to consider. Uh, yeah, we if an asteroid hit, say, the Pacific Ocean, it would cause enormous, even I know, I'm, I don't have to be a ginormous asteroid. Hitting Pacific Ocean would cause ginormous tsunamis. It would totally destroy global shipping. Like you'd wipe out all the ports in the Pacific Ring. That would really mess things up. <laughs> the Atlantic might be okay. If one hit the Atlantic, you know, that would cause a lot of trouble too. And we will see how fragile our web of commerce and industry is in our world. Our civilization itself is extremely fragile. I did another video uh, on green grapes, talking about the fragility of our, uh, of our solar, of our society, of our civilization based on the 1950s treatise written by Mr. Reed called, you know, really, truly, uh, called a pencil for the proposition that you can check it out. Now I got an OV on this, go check it out on Galactic and Green Gregs. Uh, how nobody on earth back in the 1950s knew how to build a number two pencil. Why it took cast of thousands. Imagine today with all our computerized automation. So yeah, this is a number two pencil. If this the light was washing, I maybe you can see the two right there. <laughs> Nobody on earth knows how to build a number two pencil back to, even back in the 1950s. Uh, you may find that incredible to believe. Check that video out <laughs> or look up uh, I pencil, just Google I pencil. <laughs> so there you go, guys. Um, I know we've gone along here, I've, I've had a lot to say, but. Uh, the bottom line is this, asteroids are something to be concerned about, especially in the long term. We can deal with the asteroids, though, instead of letting them hit us, let's mine them. Let's make use of them. Let's turn them, uh, those swords into plow, plow shares. Uh, there's a lot we can build in the sky, and a lot of minerals we could bring to Earth, potentially, with some of these nearer Earth asteroids. Now, main belt stuff is probably too far out to consider for now. But near Earth asteroids, uh, oh, yeah, we just discovered one. This is believed to be rich in uh, uh, platinum group metals, gold, and so forth. It's thought to have ha have a value of trillions of dollars. I'll be in maybe another video on galactic rates about that. I did one on asteroid psyche maybe a year ago and how, and how its value is crazy. And I think I called it real. Who wants to be a trillionaire? <laughs> Jeff Bezos, are you listening? You know, why, why don't continue to compete with Musk and and try to sue them forever. Put your energies into something productive. <laughs> Go out and mine the sky. Uh, anyway, uh, read, read John Lewis, Dr. John Lewis's books from the University of Arizona about mining the sky. I got tons of those books back in this bookshelf. <laughs> All right, guys. So there's my Galactic Greg Spring Greg's joint video uh, on space uh, as an uh, opportunity and a threat and how it pertains to prepping. Uh, how does it pertain to prep and one of those smaller objects could cause global disruptions and uh, supply chains worse than the ones we're seeing now? So, yeah, it, it could happen. It could happen anytime. So it's a good reason to prep. Also, you could get changes in weather with a smaller impacts, kind of like a nuclear winter that could prevail for years. Now, if you got a big impact like the Lauren King Ice Sheet, <laughs> you're in for trouble. You better know how to grow stuff for a long time on the ground. You might be talking about a thousand years. Hopefully, we, we have nothing like that on the radar that we know of in our lifetime that will be that powerful, fortunately. That even the stuff in here talking about things that would hit, you know, the good book, it would take out a third of the ships. 
that may not be as big as the alarm tide impact, guys. That may not be. I'm sending water uh, as it indicates, then uh, it might not have as big a climatic effects, but you know, it's still an impact trade. So think about that. You just got to get ready, guys. Prep. If you've never prepped before, think about it today. That's why I talk about the uh, storing food up, but you also need to grow your own food. And so uh, check my links uh, to my uh, to uh, Trulyleaf Market, where you can get great uh, heirloom seeds, the kind of seeds that if you grow the plant and plant the seeds, you get the same plant back. Hybrid seeds, you get something else, <laughs> not as good. And like your big juicy tomatoes, unfortunately, are hybrid, and so are a lot of other things, including a lot of squashes. These GMOs, it's non-GMO, non-hybrid heirloom products. That's what you really want for. Uh, growing in the garden so you can save the seeds get the same thing back year after year after year but you know, garden is an art so uh you better store up some stuff because it's going to take a while for you to get for, for all your food you need you know how to do that see my video with jason neighbors we talk about how a tenth of an acre or less than a tenth of an acre you can feed a family for uh, a good balanced diet we we'll talk about that on that video so you got to look at my green grace channel for that kind of stuff guys to know more about comets and asteroids, life in space, rocketry, uh, you find out on Galactic Gregs, and I'll be covering more of that on Galactic Gregs. I hope I get back and make more Galactic Gregs videos in the near future. Uh, I've just been extremely busy lately, and so that channel suffered, unfortunately. All right, guys, I thank everybody for watching. Uh, just stay tuned. Don't be scared to death. You know, you get somebody like Stephen Bannon out there who's telling you the asteroid's about to drop on your head, the sky's falling. Well, it could fall, but chances are, Eh, probably not today. <laughs> probably not today. Get a good night's sleep. Don't worry about it that much. <laughs> There's plenty of other things to be more concerned with. But you should prep. And also, hey, support space development. So then go out there and mine this stuff. And there's a lot of guys criticizing Jeff Bezos and all these guys sending these tourists up in the space has been it. Oh, well, focus on problems on Earth. Don't do that. That is focusing on problems on Earth because they might be the guys who save life on Earth because all this stuff, investment in space architecture, starts to build infrastructure to make going into space cheaper, which will make it more available to us to mine these objects and make good use of them instead of having to risk them coming in and hit us or give us the ability to divert them more readily than we have today. Right now, they say our best thing is the nuclear. That's turning a rifle shot into a shotgun blast. May not work out very well at all. It might make it worse. So their, their solution today is a horrible solution. Not only that, it'd be the radioactive debris coming in on us. Yikes. I don't like that notion at all. We need to find ways to keep it from hitting us, not just turning a, a rifle shot into a shotgun blast coming at us. A radioactive shotgun blast at that. Hmm. We can do better than that, but we need space infrastructure to do that. And that's why these little hops, you know, with uh, Captain Kirk. <laughs> matter. That's why they're good. That's why they should happen. And uh, those of you that are out there throwing stones at it, go away. You don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everybody, for watching, and have an awesome good night.